This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for this special episode of Once Upon a Crime. The Palace, from the Tudors to the Windsors, 500 Years of British History at Hampton Court is a wonderful book about the story of the British monarchy as it was lived out within Hampton Court Palace. Hampton Court is often cited as one of the most beautiful palaces in England, and it has been the setting for so many things, royal weddings, coronation balls, court intrigue, murder and assassination plots, sex scandals, and so much, so many more important events in British history some of which, like me, you are probably unaware. So I am so delighted to speak with the author of The Palace, Gareth Russell. Gareth has somehow managed to include 500 years of the history of Hampton Court in a really fun and engaging read. You'll hear stories of some of the most intriguing people who grace the halls of the palace, stories that I found very surprising, fascinating, and sometimes very funny. I laughed out loud more than once while reading The Palace. And you don't often have that experience with a history book, which... This is much more than a history book, so I. But I'll let you guys, you know, hear straight from the author, like about the book, and you'll you'll see for yourself that it really is a fun read. Gareth Russell takes you room by room and era by era to tell the stories of Hampton Court in this wonderful book, The Palace. Welcome, Gareth. Oh, Esther, thank you so much for having me. I'll just, you know, say this out up front. This is a little bit different from what I normally do on the podcast. I'm a true crime podcast. We do, uh, you know, crime stories. This month, though, every month I have a different topic. And this month, we just, or last month, actually, we just finished um, a series about royal murders. So this kind of fits in with that because, you know, there, yeah. there are some, I've, you know, I've did some more modern ones and some older ones, but... This has been a place I have not been to yet, and this is a place that I do plan to go to this year because I am going to London again. And um, usually, when I go to London, I go for an event called CrimeCon, uh, CrimeCon UK, mm-hmm. and I've been there for three years. But I just never have any time extra, and I'm gonna make extra time this year to go to Hampton Palace because I've been fascinated by this place and what well, Tudor, you know, just the, the whole history of the Tudors for a long, long time. But this is this was a different experience for me because, and I'm sure for anyone who picks up this book, because it's telling it from a, a specific lens, which is about Hampton Palace. So Hampton Court Palace, right? So I think, first of all, that most people equate a Hampton Court Palace with Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn, right? Isn't that like the main thing people kind of know if they know anything about it at all? Um, but Henry wasn't the original occupant, right? So it really kind of starts with this whole, you know, very interesting story. Um, and can you tell us a little bit about that? Like how did it become in, come into possession of Henry VIII? Um, and, uh, you know, just, just kind of like, is that where you started with when you started writing this book? Did you start from that place? Yeah. I mean, I, so when I started it, you know, people, some people had said, you know, that there was, you know, there was an owner before Henry VIII, his chief advisor, Cardinal Woolsey lived there right before him. And actually it goes back even further. So the, uh, it was a manor, Hampton means the place on the bend of the river, which is where it's located outside London. And is the key to its success. A lot of people, you know, used it to escape plague. It was near London, but to be convenient to the centres of power. But it was also far enough away to be from the centres of disease, which in the in the Middle Ages is pretty much the sweet spot when you're building a palace. But originally, it for most of the Middle Ages belonged to what I would say is the most medieval of all crossover brands, which is warrior monks. Mm. And they were an order called the Order of the Knights Hospitalier of St. John of Jerusalem, uh, known as the Knights Hospitalier. And they were originally a product of the Crusades. And there was a family called the Sambalares who owned this sort of minor but very pretty mansion, uh, manor, sorry, at Hampton, who fought on the Crusades. And they gave a bit of land to the Knights Hospitalier in gratitude. 
and the knights turned it into really a glorified Airbnb. Mm -hmm. And what they would do, because it was in between two major medieval royal palaces. So because travel took such a long amount of time then, Esther, a lot of people would stop at Hampton and they would be put up by the church in this quite nice manner. But, you know, it was a little bit like an honesty box uh, in a in a modern hotel. You were expected to make a contribution to the order in return for the hospitality and then they start renting it out it becomes a kind of you get access to the whole house airbnb setup it's no longer on a room only basis and they start renting it out to very prominent members of the royal court Uh, and they usually give quite generous lease terms and the last person to rent it is Henry VIII's chief advisor, his chief minister, Cardinal Wolsey, Mm. who is allowed under the terms of his lease to expand it. And Wolsey really does nothing by halves. He's a great showman, as much as he is churchman and politician. And he turns it into a beautiful palace. And then in the late 1520s, Wolsey loses King Henry VIII's favour because he, he promises that he will persuade the Pope to give Henry a divorce from his first wife, Catherine of Aragon. And that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. And in retribution, Henry takes Wolsey's political office from him, but he also takes the lease to Hampton Court. And then, four years later, England breaks with the Roman Catholic Church over this crisis, and church assets are secularised. A lot of them are secularised. And so Hampton Court transfers completely into the ownership of the monarchy in the 1530s. And that means that Henry VIII and his second wife, Anne Boleyn, are the first king and queen to live there as a royal residence. So that's like a whistle-stop tour through the Middle Ages via some very sword-handy but money-smart monks. Yeah, Yeah. and I mean, how much money he sank into this thing to turn it into this beautiful palace. I mean, it was amazing. And I think that's one of the things that people are... You know, when you think about the clergy, you think, oh, you know, they take a vow of poverty. And, you know, I mean, that's what we think of. But no, we're not talking. That's not what's happening with this, with cardinals here, right? <laughs> that's at least not with Wolsey. No, no, great point. So they, yes, they specifically, there are certain monastic orders that are required to take vows of poverty. And they're the, the, stri- the strict ones that you maybe don't want to join. And you certainly don't want to share confessor because they set much harsher uh, penance. <laughs> Woolsey and the the cardinals are called the princes of the church. And there is a verse in the Bible that says, if you are a bishop or aspire to higher office in the church, your household should be a center of hospitality. I'm paraphrasing here. Mm -hmm. But Woolsey, like a lot of princes of the church, takes that verse and runs with it and says that, you know, it is their duty to display, display, excuse me, the best of Christian hospitality and magnificence. And that is a very tenuous theological basis for building places like Hampton Court, but probably confirmation bias if you're someone like Woolsey. <laughs> so where did the money come from then? Like, where did where did Woolsey get his money to be able his to yeah, yeah. spend so much on this Should palace? We, see, it's immensely complicated how they do it, but we're always, as Tudor historians, quite grateful to them because the money leaves a paper trail and you can see what the money spent on and then reconstruct these buildings, some of which don't survive. Luckily, Hampton Court does. So the Woolsey has, like all, he's also the Archbishop of York. So underneath him, there will be an archdiocese and there will be a series of properties that are usually left of the church in wills and testaments. Of, so by, by the time of the Reformation, the church owns nearly a third of the land mm. in England. And so the rent generated from this land that is left of the church and left to particular archdiocese creates an enormous amount of money, mm. um, some of which goes into charity, some goes to individual monasteries. A lot is used by the, the bishop or the archbishop to maintain the household and to oversee the running of the diocese. So that's where a lot of the money comes from. Woolsey also is an organizational genius. I, I don't think, despite being a cardinal, your listeners will be stunned to surprise that there's never been a movement to make him a saint. But he certainly is, in secular terms, an extraordinary politician. And he really has an eye for the minutiae of things, which also means that Henry VIII gives him 
you know, access to certain secular forms of, of income that come to the Lord Chancellor, which is sort of the equivalent of Prime Minister back then. Mm. So he is getting money from both sacred and secular revenue streams that make the creation of palaces like Hampton Court possible. The other benefit that he has over aristocrats is he can't get married. You know, it's at this point, it still is the case today, the Catholic priesthood cannot get married. Mm -hmm. So it means that the money he has, he doesn't have to worry about leaving a family fortune to continue a dynasty Mm. into the next generation. So he can spend what he's got. Good point. Good point. Yeah, I didn't think about that. That's true. Yeah. And it's almost like, I mean, that amount of money, it's just, it's, it's crazy. One of those things that we talk about, like, how much money do you really need? You know what I mean? Right. But he needed quite a bit right. to make it, make, you know, Hampton Court what it was, I think. Um, the other thing that we know, um, a little, you know, the history, whole history of Henry VIII and his wives is this infamous chapter in British history. And I know that you wrote a book before this one about one of the of uh, Henry VIII's doomed wives, Catherine Parr. Yes. Um, that book. Catherine Howard was mine. Ha- Catherine Howard. Oh, it was Catherine Howard. Catherine Howard. Yeah. Sorry, I don't know why I write Captain Catherine Parr. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. No, Cap- that, that, no, don't worry. <laughs> my sister made that mistake once. She congratulated me on my book on Catherine Parr, and I was like, "You really should know better." <laughs> yeah. I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Catherine. Howard. And that book was t- titled Young and Damned and Fair. That's already on my reading list. That's yes. already for ne- my next thing, because um, I need to oh, know a little, a little bit about, about this, because I, you went into more detail than I um, had heard before. So tell us a little bit about that. And, and I'm also wanting to, to, to ask you a little bit about the, uh, the Haunted Gallery, because there, there's a story about yeah. her in that, too. So can you tell us a little about Catherine yeah. Howard? So Catherine Howard is, and this sort of in perfect for your podcast, because it is sort of the intersection of royalty and murder mm-hmm. and crime, at least. Um, she's his fifth wife. She is about 18 when they marry in 1540. He's 49. Uh, she's queen until 1541. So that gives you an idea of just how short the period is. Mm-hmm. She is executed in 1542. And Catherine has a reputation either as being sort of an airhead or being a very sort of perpetually sad victim. And actually, she had a great a spark of personality. She was very charismatic, outgoing, apparently extremely beautiful. And in the winter of 1541, she is at Hampton Court and really seems to be riding high in her husband's favour. There is a mass offered in the Chapel Royal, the palace's chapel, giving thanks for the Queen, how happy she has made the King. And then all of a sudden, the atmosphere in the palace changes and one of Catherine's servants, a man called Francis Durham, is arrested and he's accused of having committed piracy off the coast of Ireland. And initially, everyone, no one really likes Francis. He's sort of, you know, a bit of a player and incredibly rude. And so all the other servants think, oh dear, you know, no, we're not going to miss him. <laughs> but then they start arresting maids in the household and they then detain the Queen's aunt, a, a Welsh lady called Lady Margaret Howard. And it becomes clear that they have been tipped off by a former family servant who has said that Catherine was not a virgin when she married the king and that she had lost her virginity to Francis and that they'd actually been engaged before they married. And Francis had worked as a merchant in Ireland shortly after the engagement broke off. And that gave Henry's advisors a sort of um, convenient fig leaf to arrest him without provoking suspicion in the queen. Mm. And Francis had confessed and what they had done, which I had, the biography you mentioned, Young and Damned and Fair, I had separated out all the surviving testimonies and realised that the counsellors, the advisors of the king split themselves into groups. They did not use undue force. They didn't try to pressure them. They didn't let anyone cross-contaminate their testimony with other people. Hmm. And so it was clear that this servant had been telling the truth. And under contemporary church law, if you were engaged to someone else and you had sex with them, it was called something called a pre-contract, mm. which meant that neither of you could legally marry anybody else unless there was a dispensation provided by the church. And so Catherine 
when she's confronted by this in her beautiful apartments at Hampton Court, initially tries to brazen it out, but she very quickly realises, because she's nowhere near as stupid as some historians and sort of historical myth has painted her, she quickly realises that if she is found guilty of bigamy, she will lose her title as queen and may very well be sentenced to life imprisonment. Mm. And so... She also then, she's, I should point this out, she, you know, um, she's very, very frightened at this stage. And she's being interrogated in her rooms by the Archbishop of Canterbury. And she tries to throw him off the scent by saying that Francis is sort of a windbag who can't be trusted. And he's obsessed with her, which is true. Perpetually jealous, which is true. And she then says, you know, he even used to be jealous of my friendship with Thomas Culpepper who is a very disreputable but good-looking member of the royal court. And she is trying to throw the archbishop off the scent, but in saying that, she unwittingly puts him on the scent. Mm. And the archbishop cannot figure out why on earth she would mention Culpepper at a moment like this unless Culpepper was relevant. And so a search of Hoare's bedrooms is ordered at Hampton Court. And in Culpepper's room, they find a love letter from the Queen to him. And so he is arrested and taken from Hampton Court. And the next day she is legally stripped of her title and moved out of Hampton Court under arrest. And she spends the last winter of her life at a sort of country house nearby called Zion Abbey. And she's then moved at the start of February to the Tower of London where she's beheaded on the 13th of February. Her favourite lady in waiting is beheaded for arranging the meetings because it turns out Catherine and Thomas Culpepper had been meeting late at night. After her wedding, Thomas Culpepper is beheaded for that and Francis Derham is um, hand-drawn and quartered for having known Catherine wasn't eligible to marry the king and still um, keeping it secret to himself and entering her service afterwards, which the king believes means he wanted to um, start up post-marital relations with her. Because Francis... For some reason, Henry is angrier at Francis than he is at Thomas. It's quite strange. But Mm -hmm. um, Francis, the sentence of hanging, drawing and quartering for your listeners, I'm sure some of them know. So you are hanged by the neck until you're half dead. So until you're kind of going into that spasms when you're being throttled and then they cut you down, they will then castrate you in front of the crowd, um, disembowel you, and then they will decapitate you hit you and the quartering is when they cut your limbs into four pieces and each of them are sent to a different area maybe a parish where you were baptized or a parish where you committed your sins or were married they are sent to four areas that are tainted by your crime and each limb is displayed in in one of them so that in a nutshell is sort of this and it's the focus of, of chapter six in the book yeah, I mean the haunted gallery. People don't realize how brutal that is. Like, I think I was uh, reading a book about the Tower of London, and when they went into detail yeah. about that, and I was like, "Holy crap, <laughs> that is brutal!" Yeah. I mean, that's like yeah, going to be like the was, worst sentence you can have. Yeah, it's awful. A friend was reading Young and Damned and Fair, and he had actually brought. It, we were away on a trip together, and he brought it, and I knew what part he got to. Just <laughs> reading by the fire. And looked up and said, holy blankety blank. Um, <laughs> he, uh, yeah, it's it, it's grotesque. It's it so, and, and it's also, there is there is a ritualistic brutality there. There is performative justice that, that's happening there. So, but part of the challenge for this book, Esther, was that having written about her downfall, obviously it's the final sort of quarter mm-hmm. of Young and Damned and Fair. I, I thought like, oh, do I... Um, do I touch on Catherine, Queen Catherine's downfall at Hampton Court? And my initial stupid thought was not to. But then I then I realised that her downfall is so integral to the history and mythology of Hampton Court, as you alluded to. Mm-hmm. And um, I thought, well, what I can do this time is having told the downfall from the perspective of the principal victims in Young and Damned and Fair, in the palace, I will describe what it looked like to people who worked for the royal family, her ladies in waiting. What would it look like in the rest of the palace as they try to piece together what is happening? Mm-hmm. Uh, here, the scandal unfolds. And that sort of is, is why, it, in part, it's called the Haunted Gallery. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so there, so there, there's all these uh, stories. I mean, we, we know this about 
any yeah. place that's a historical place where a lot of things have had a lot of history, Perfect. that you're going to have ghost stories. You, you just are, right? Yes. <laughs> and so this is this is the place in this chapter is with the haunted gallery is talking about you know Catherine Howard, but then other kind of ghost hauntings there that people have talked about. Um, and yeah. one of the things I thought about when I was reading this and after I finished the chapter was well, well Henry VIII, Henry VIII had many of those who fell out of favor with him executed, correct? I mean, so it's going to be, you know, more of these kind of, uh, you know, yeah. these tragic <laughs> yeah, yeah. souls haunting the place. So when did this, this, when did this, uh, this mythology Pardon. of the haunted, you know, gallery, when did that come, come into play in, at Hampton Court? Well, it's a great point because portraits in the Tudor world, Esther, are like ghosts. When anyone finds one, it's never like, you know, Joe Bloggs or, poor old Sarah Smith, the kitchen maid. They always assume it has to be one of his queens right. or the most famous person they've heard of. But the Haunted Gallery runs from the site of what was Catherine's private rooms. Down, it's a corridor that links it to the council chamber where Henry's advisors met. But off the, sort of halfway down and to the right, there are two rooms that lead to a balcony where the royal family attended church in Catherine's lifetime. And the legend of the Haunted Gallery is that when Catherine realised she was in trouble, she was doomed, and was being detained to her rooms, she gambled on trying to get to her husband, and she slipped past the guards and ran down the corridor screaming for Henry to see her and to show her mercy. Mm. And he was in the balcony hearing mass, and just as she was about to get there, the guards caught up with her and dragged her, still screaming for mercy back to her apartments so generally speaking a lot of people who have written about hampton court have said it's impossible that this is true that isn't quite true so during my research i find out there is a window when it could have happened so she found out that she was in real trouble on the 6th of november and in the morning and he left the palace and never saw her again in the evening so there is a window that afternoon around the time would have been celebrated for her it's also true that she would have had to go through quite a few rooms to get there, but because she was being detained, a lot of her rooms, a lot of those rooms potentially could have been um, empty or, or less populated than usual. So it is possible, as is what we know of Queen Catherine's mental state at this point. The difficulty is, I can't answer your question mm -hmm. about where the story originates. Mm -hmm. It, there's, it's not mentioned anywhere in the contemporary sources, but we can't pinpoint where it usually can spot. There's like a breadcrumb trail. So there's, um, in the Victorian period, the monarchy turned Hampton Court into apartments for former servants and courtiers who were maybe struggling financially. And some of these courtiers would invent ghost stories if they didn't like the apartment they got and say, I'm haunted, I need to be moved to one with the garden view. Um, and sometimes the, the, the stories like that, you know, like, um, but... This one does not correlate at all with any with any of that. We we can't find where this originates. So it could be nonsense. Mm -hmm. What I will say is that uh, this winter, in a move I have to assume indicates just the sheer depth of my idiocy, I was recording a podcast episode with the current chief curator at Hampton Court, Tracy, and do the Catherine Howard one. We'll, we'll, we'll record it at Hampton Court. And I said, ooh, why don't we do it after dark when no one's there? <laughs> and so obviously they suggested the Haunted Gallery. And so we stood there for about deep necessarily and things like that. But there is very definitely, there is a point in the Haunted Gallery, I have to say, where it is oddly and unusually cold and it's nowhere near a window. And that is a place where even people who don't know about the haunting seem to have sort of kind of quite unpleasant experiences. Yeah. Um, I don't know. All I can say is certainly it is a very atmospheric place, but then maybe any room in a palace after dark in the middle of winter around Halloween would be Gareth. Do you know, like it's, it's sort of, yeah. I can sort of play both of those arguments in my head. All I can say with, with, with being honest is I try to be led by what I see and what I feel. And yes, there is, it's a, it's a very, um, it is a, it doesn't ever really feel like it's empty, even if it's just you in it. Hmm, yeah, there's a there's a, a a place here. It's called the Winchester Mystery House, and it was uh, built by Sarah Winchester. It's you know people know it kind of around the world as this very haunted place. And yeah, and it's like it's like that. I've been you know it's right here around the corner from from uh, where I live, and 
I've been several times, and there are those cold places you walk through, and it's really odd. You right. Know? Yeah. I know exactly right. how that feels. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, because I don't, I mean, I mean, it, yeah, there was one other experience I had. All I will say is that there was one point where I was leaving the kitchens, which are the the oldest surviving room there. They, 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 some parts of the kitchens have, are still work from 1495, mm-hmm. and the staff like the same in the same fireplaces there. But I left and was walking down one of the corridors, and it's sort of like a paved back corridor that linked the kitchen up to the Great Hall. So it really would have been like a servant's thoroughfare uh-huh. back in the day when the palace was in full use. And I just remember stopping. It's like a T, like a T junction where some of these these corridors intersect and i had the strongest feeling that someone was watching me Hmm. and there was no one there and it was just and again that could just be i had spent you know a couple of years researching this and had immersed myself in it and you know knew some of the stories from that part of the the palace but yeah that was that was the only other time it had usual yeah yeah, you got to kind of uh, expect that in a place with so much history that there's going to be some weird, yes, weird exactly. energy there for sure. Yeah, you can't really, you can't really avoid that. That's so, true. I don't want to give away all the great stories in the book because I really want people to have that experience that I did, where you're kind of like discovering these little treats throughout, you know, the pages of the palace. But I'll ask about a couple <laughs> that stand out to me. Um, yeah. One of them was about a very curious portrait that hung on a wall in at Hampton Court, and it was yes. of, uh, you know I got to that point and I and I had to read I go what, wait a minute stop what <laughs> I had to read it again like because it was it was very short like a half a page about this or maybe a page and uh, I was like and and this was something that they would you know show to visitors and very seemed to be very yeah. proud of this thing. And it was about a family that had been kidnapped and brought to England. So tell tell listeners a little bit yep. about that odd story. <laughs> I am so glad you said that. You're the first person who's asked me about that. <laughs> well, I have a weird uh, mind. <laughs> and that, no, that actually was that was the only thing that made me cry. I'm not really much of a crier, but that story was just cool. so horrific. Mm-hmm. Um, I came across this account in '99 by a Swiss doctor called Thomas Platter. And he had graduated from medical school in France and he came from a fairly wealthy Swiss family and did kind of the tour. You know, he he went around Europe and he left a journal of his travels. And it's a goldmine because he was well connected enough to be given permission to tour Hampton Court just after Elizabeth I had moved on to another palace. So it's and also quite weird to think of the palace staff like supplementing their income with uh, with, with you know uh, providing slightly illegal tours. Anyway, um, Thomas Platter is taken into a room that no longer exists. Half the palace um, was demolished in the 17th century and replaced with a Baroque wing as a sort of middle finger to Versailles. But in one of the rooms, he tells he he's been shown by some of the staff a series of paintings and portraits, and some of them are. You know, that they're allegorical figures of love, or they are some really beautiful pieces of embroidery that have been made by Elizabeth's mother Anne Boleyn. But then he comes to a sort of family portrait, if you like. And it, th- this this painting too has been lost. We think it maybe was destroyed in the Civil War half a century later. But there are copies of it, which is why I, I really was determined to have one of the, the copies of it in the illustration section because it was pulverizing. So they were an Inuit family from what is now um, Eastern Canada. And an English privateer, sort of glorified pirate called Martin Frobisher, kidnapped them, found them and kidnapped them. There is some debate over whether in fact the man and the woman were husband and wife or whether they were simply part of an Inuit community that I assumed that they were family. Mm. So... The gentleman in the family that we have name, we, the historians have given them names. They're actually Inuit names that indicate man, woman, and, and child. Um, either when he's being kidnapped or when he's on the ship taking him to England, where they are planning to make a fortune displaying him as a curiosity, bites his tongue so severely, and it becomes infected on the voyage. When they reach Bristol, which is a port in western England, the mother. Calico and her child Nitwak have both both have no immunity to, to European diseases. And when they come to Bristol, they are sort of displaying this family like animals in a circus, really, is the closest way I can describe it. And despite the fact that the gentleman 
the father is clearly extremely unwell. The wound of the tongue has become infected. They have also stolen an Inuit canoe and they put it outside an inn in Bristol and they put him in it. And they, the, the townsfolk, the city folk come and pay to watch him. And the trick that they can do is this man is an incredibly skilled hunter. So they have him throw darts at ducks and kill them. And that's the trick from increasing distances. He dies after only, I think, a week. It is maybe it's a few, I, mean, I don't think it's much longer than that um, in Bristol. And by this point, his his widow, presumed widow, has contracted measles. And that, in fairness, that would kill even Europeans. There were some Europeans would die. If you have no immunity to it whatsoever, it's invariably lethal. And so she dies in Bristol. The child, the orphaned child, Nutwak, is taken to London as the last surviving member of this family. And she too is paraded and displayed in front of Londoners who pay a fee to see her. She was like six, right? Um, Something like that. Like I said, very young. She, yeah, she's very young. There's it's no, it's a it's a child. Oh, okay. And but you could probably say enslavers, to be totally honest, um, don't speak their language. Mm. So there there's guesses. The reason why we know that that she was very young is that the portrait of her shows her neck in there. And probably mercifully for this child, actually, considering how she had been treated, she also has contracted the measles from her mother. And this spell of just, I mean, horrific, brutal, greed-laced cruelty does not last long. And she is dead within weeks of going to London. Then she's buried in St. Olaf's Church in the city. So this entire family, I can't imagine what it feels like to be kidnapped by people you can't understand, mm. put on a ship you don't have a form of transport that you don't have a frame of reference for. Mm. You know, there's no communication in the 16th century. Continents don't know what the other one looks like. It would be as traumatic today as being stuck up into a spaceship. Like there's just there's no comparison. Mm -hmm. So every day you're paraded like like these bears that Thomas Platter saw, which is also deeply tragic, being you know mauled to death. Mm -hmm. It was just such an appalling thing to read about. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. It's it would be like being abducted by aliens, you know, and it just being terrified of yes, what's it happening it to you, right? Yeah, and, that, and that's not and that's not to say necessarily that European technology, when it came to things like navigating, was superior or stronger. It's simply to say that it the, there was no frame of reference right. to Inuit cultures. It, it it would be this you would have as much chance of knowing you and I what is inside an alien spaceship as they would what this ship could do. Um, and and any experience they did have of it was horror, was just unutterable horror. Before they died, it seems to have been a sort of his and her set. Like there was the man and then there was the mother of the child. And you have to look for Nituak. She's in the hood, as I said. Mm -hmm. But Thomas Platter, the Swiss tourist, saw them and he says um, that the man's face looked as if it had been wheeled, which means beaten. I mean, it looks like he'd been whipped. Mm -hmm. And the, yeah, you know, he, he describes seeing it and then they move him on and they show another portrait of the goddess of love and a uh, Greek myth scene. And one of the things that I was quite conscious of was, you know, you can't go beyond what Hampton Court covers. So, you know, people, you've read the book, you, you'll know that the great use of the palace declines is just before the real era of mass slave trading begins in British history. They're, 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 those aren't linked. And there wasn't, there was really only two opportunities in the book to discuss through these horrible episodes without feeling like you were going beyond the, the narrative of this book. Mm -hmm. And one of them, which is in the Georgian section, is on chocolate and how much chocolate was being used at Hampton mm -hmm. Court. And that this is sort of feeding into the first really massive stance taken against slavery in Jamaica. But this one, this trafficking of this Inuit family in the 1590s was something that I've never heard discussed. Yeah, no. And, and in part, Esther, that is because when you are dealing with something that happens a generation later after them, when you start to see across the Americas and Europe, you see a process of, of slave trading out of Africa that will lead to the diaspora of 12 million Africans. It's it's your head around you know, the scale of the humanitarian tragedy there. But it also means that sometimes 
what we did when you see an individual family that there's something about the minutiae of the cruelty that you can show with an individual family mm. so that was that was and this was just it was it was heartbreaking absolutely heartbreaking and then and, and part of the difficulty with this family is you cannot comfort yourself by saying a skill pebble of an absolutely devastating avalanche that's coming mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. It is such a like a little powerful little story in there because it is so personal. Like you said, it's not the, you know, a big story about massive slave trading. It's about one family and individually what right. they went through. So it definitely does kind of give you a sense of how horrible, you know, it is. It just that very personal kind of look, look at it. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, it was. Yeah, yeah that's absolutely. why I said I read it and I was like, wait a minute, what? And I read it again. I actually read it again again this morning because I'm like, is this? How do I even? How do I even approach this? This is so you know, this is so horrible, and it's not anything that I ever even That's had right. heard right. happen, you know, before, or even a story yeah. like it. To be honest, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. So I could I I see why you definitely why you put it in the book, but yeah, that was um it it, it was a a very dark dark story. Um, but okay, so let's. Kind of end on a, a little bit of a, of a of a lighter note because, there, like yeah. I said, there was some things in it that made me laugh. Um, I, I, I I was laughing. I was telling somebody I was laughing so hard I was like I couldn't even breathe. I was like, well, I, it was okay. It was a story about the Body House riots of 1668. <laughs> okay. I did. There were two that were in my head. Yeah, the Body House right. riots. Yeah, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So <laughs> this is a story about um, how uh, there was a, madams, right? They, they taunted Charles II's right. mistress, asking why <laughs> she didn't help regarding the crackdown of the sex industry. Okay. Now you yeah. got to think about right. that for a minute. And it's like, oh, <laughs> okay. they're like, yeah. hey, you're no better than us. <laughs> Like, well, why, listen, why aren't you, you having the same treatment just because you're, you know, the Charles? Uh, you, Charles you, you got a better paycheck, honey. Than your, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, well, it's, yeah. So, it, yeah, it's it's basically you got a better paycheck, honey, but you're not better than us. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly it. So the, the body house riots in 1668, uh, there was, so, so the monarchy was abolished at the end of the Civil War in 1649, and there were 11 years of Republican rule in Britain, and the Republic tended to have very puritanical tendencies, or at least it was seen as a welcoming environment for Puritan politics. And when the monarchy was restored in 1660, it was under a king called Charles II, who who, um, did not have Puritan morals, and had a string of mistresses. He was known as the Merry Mark. And with the kind of the relaxation of the Republic's Puritan code, a lot of body houses or brothels pop up over London. And there are riots in London by groups of young Puritans who are outraged at this attack on tradition, on morality. (laughs) Unfortunately, whilst they are attacking brothels and prostitutes and burning the brothels, the body houses down, a a lot of the body houses' most loyal clientele, particularly sailors, rally to defend the body houses. And there are fights between um, the prostitutes' patrons and the prostitutes persecutors so these are the riots and in the middle of it three of the most well-known madams in london put together an absolutely scorchingly rude piece of satire to the government that they called the poor whores petition for royal mercy and essentially they are saying why are our homes getting torched to the ground and no one is going to Hampton Court or to the Palace of Whitehall to burn them down because there's plenty of ladies of ill repute there. And they address it to King Charles's chief mistress, Lady Castlemaine, who is the focus of Chapter 16, Barbara, the Curse of the Nation Villiers. And it is a delicious middle finger. <laughs> to say, look, your paycheck's better and you live in luxury and we run around being afraid that we're going to be, you know, punched in the face and burned out of our homes by religious zealots. So one of the things that they do, when they, what the Puritans do when they capture any suspected uh, prostitute is they will duck her. So they'll take her to the local river or the well and they will kind of dunk her in it as punishment. They won't drown her, but they'll, they'll duck her. Mm-hmm. And there's a rhyme that the Adams come up with about Barbara. 
and they say the reason why you are not ducked because by Caesar you are fucked. Yeah. <laughs> I have to. I mean, I know it's so juvenile, but chapter sixteen on the sex capades going on at Hampton Court in the sixteen sixties was kind of a joy to write. <laughs> it's just this. It's a bodice ripping carousel of bad behavior. And part of it, I think, is because a lot of these people did grow up under the Puritan Republic and they're sort of stuck in this perpetual rebellious adolescence when the monarchy comes back. But, you know, things like Charles II also was famous in British history because he ends the laws that ban women from appearing on the stage as actresses. Mm. And one of his mistresses becomes an actor, is an actress, Nell Gwynne. And when another actress catches the king's eye, you know, Nell says, look, Mole, we're both working girls here. Um, there's no hard feelings at all. We, you know, we both have to earn our bread on the night that Mole is due to spend her first night with the king. Sadly, Nell has laced the candies with a vigorous dose of laxative <laughs> so that Mole is not able to take her place in the king's bed. That was brilliant. I was like, it's minor crime, yeah. but it is a huge... It's like, it basically is like a kind of roulette yeah. of you just spin it and see which scandal it lands on for about 15 years. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Nell Gwynn, I remember because they called her Cinder Nell. Yeah. <laughs> Cinder Nell, yeah, because she, 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 she was this... And, and also, this, I actually think this is just the perfect amount of Hudson. She Nell was um, you know, like many most of England at the time, a, a Protestant girl. And one of Charles's other mistresses was a, a down in her luck French aristocrat, Louise de Carroal, who was Catherine. And they really disliked Louise, partly because she was French and partly because they suspected she was a spy for the French government. And also because she was Catholic and it was a rampagingly anti-Catholic period in British history. And at one point, uh, a carriage was part of the royal um, transport fleet, if you like. And they see a very beautiful woman inside. They start pelting at this girl, shouting, it's the Catholic whore, it's the people, you're mistaken. I am a Protestant whore. <laughs> and it was just the kind of, to, to take issue with the Protestant versus Catholic, but not the word whore. It's just the perfect level of confidence that Nell Gwynn has. So yeah, that chapter 16 was a total riot yeah. un unintended but unregretted to write about yeah it was like yeah it was like a, it was like a comment i could see her you know, doing that like it like if you had a, a movie version yeah. of this <laughs> when yes. coming out of the carriage <laughs> excuse me <laughs> not a catholic yeah. whore i'm a protestant whore. <laughs> <laughs> that was just brilliant i love that i'm like i like this person i don't know <laughs> he's great <laughs> yeah yeah she's great <laughs> So, so I want to see if I'm going to be jealous here. So how much access did you have to the actual palace while you wrote this book? I mean, uh, did you have to go on a, a tourist ticket like uh, the rest of us or did you get it like an all access pass? Like, how did you um, what, what kind of access did you uh, have? Great, great question. So um, I said, look, it's really the last palace that has that span of time and busyness historically that we can visit. So I can visit it while I'm doing the research. So yes, in the initial first draft, Esther, I, I played the tourist. Mm -hmm. But to play the jealous part, in once the drafts were done, there were people there who sort of let me behind the scenes and into places that are closed. So yeah, I have been allowed, you know, it, it, into some of the places that they can't open to the public, some places that are, you know, the longer corridors at the back. They, ha they have been not interfered in any way, which is a real testament. So the Hampton Court is still owned by the monarchy, mm -hmm. but it is run by something called Historic Royal Palaces, which is an independent charity. So Historic Royal Palaces, in return for that, has total freedom on what they can stage, you know, exhibition-wise. Mm -hmm. It's not beholden to any government. And I have to say, they were, when the book came out, they they were wonderful, really, really wonderful. And there is something really special about wandering around Hampton Court when it's empty. That is an, it's an extraordinary privilege that I will cherish for the rest of my life. Yeah. I hope it shows in the book, you know, that, I, that I've been able to, to, to see it when it's quiet. Yeah. And I was going to say that, you know, m maybe we don't get to... To, to do that but luckily we have the book so <laughs> you got to do that so that's great because then we you. got a little bit more um that i'm sure that we would you know we'd be able to experience uh even going there but um so just to to kind of uh cap things off tell the listeners where they can find out more about you and about your books oh and i had one more question do they have your book in the in the gift shop at hampton court because yeah. they should because yeah they they do they uh, do and i awesome. um 
I didn't. I didn't. Uh, I didn't. It was quite a. It was a very sweet moment. I didn't know they had it. It is so so special to see it there of all places. Yeah, I. I that's why I was. I was saying it, it better be there. <laughs> it has to be there in the gift shop. Come on. Yeah. So and so where yeah. where do they find more about you and your books? And uh, you have a website or somewhere yes. that they can find so, yeah, if anyone's interested, Instagram is where I'm most active, underscore Gareth Russell. I do have my own podcast. It's on seasonal break at the minute called Single Malt History, which combines two of my loves. Um, as I do have a Facebook page as well, but Instagram is generally where I'm most active. All right, great. Yeah, we'll, we'll put links in the show notes so you guys can grab those there. Great. And uh, yeah, thank and you. a link to the book as well. So thank you so much. This was such a fun conversation and I knew it would be. And I love the book and I'm definitely going to recommend it to everybody I know that is interested in, in this. Or maybe even if they're not, like uh, they, they probably don't. <laughs> If they don't know, this is this is a good place to start just to get the stories because believe me, I'll be reading chapter sixteen over again <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Esther, thank you. For, I was so pleased with that. That was uh, yeah. I'm so pleased with chapter sixteen. Um, thank you so much for this. I actually had such a blast. I really enjoyed this interview. Once again, I'd like to thank Gareth Russell for being my guest. You can find a link to purchase his book, The Palace, From the Tudors to the Windsors, 500 Years of British History at Hampton Court at simonandschuster.com, amazon.com, barnesandnoble.com, and anywhere you purchase books. I've included a link in the show notes for your convenience. That will do it for this episode of Once Upon a Crime. I'll be starting our new series for March, Tarnished Hollywood, next week. I'll be detailing stories about Hollywood actors who ran afoul of the law. Until next time, be good to one another.